No one ever gasps in awe when they see the Laurentian Mountains for the first time. <laughs> Rather than awe, first-time visitors who've spent a morning being toured through Les Laurentides are more apt to turn to whoever it is that's been driving them and ask that mortifying question so many have asked before them. When do we get to the mountains? <laughs> they are, admittedly, more hills than mountains. The Laurentians roll rather than tower, and they roll with a dignity that befits one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. The Laurentians and the pleasing lakes that dot the hills make you feel that there is both comfort and constancy to be had in this constantly changing world. Ah, tour les lacs des Laurentides, lac Marois, lac Saint-Amour, lac des Saisirs, et tous les little lakeside villages. <laughs> Saint Sauveur, Saint Rémy, Val des Bois, and of course, Notre Dame des Plaines. Hardly a village, really. One gas station, two general stores, a Catholic church, and a handful of cottages. Notre Dame des Plaines and Petit Lac Noir. The little village and the little lake lapping just over the hill, just behind the church where Jean-Francois Clément and his wife Marie-José have whiled away summer afternoons since, well, since before Jean-Francois was a boy, and before. Every Friday at 5.30 precisely, Jean-Francois closes his office. He's a small animal vet. And if someone were to arrive at, say, 5.25, he would, well, I would like to help you, he might say. Mais le bureau est fermé. <laughs> and he would give you, or whomever it was standing there holding their sick cat or spastic dog, directions to the nearest emergency clinic. <laughs> he would, incidentally, mean it. Jean-Francois is nothing if not both earnest and honest. He would like to help you. But how could he at 5.30 on Friday? <laughs> 5.30 on Friday is when he picks up Marie-José and they drive, like his father did before him, to the cottage for the weekend. Stopping on the way, of course, like his father did, at the Boulanger in Shawbridge to pick up a country loaf and a baguette. The idea of phoning Marie-José and leaving later wouldn't occur to Jean-Francois. 5.30 is when you leave. <laughs> the cottage has been in Jean-Francois's family for five generations. For five generations, Clémence have been learning lessons from the mountains. And what they have learned is to pray at the altar of tradition. The cottage and everything about it, the way you get there and the things you do when you arrive, has been passed down like a religious relic. It is a cathedral of constancy. Nothing has changed since it was built. Now, you mustn't get the idea that it's run down. It's been kept up perfectly, but not updated. <laughs> it's one of those endangered species, a cottage of the old style. There's an indoor toilet now, but there's also a wood stove and a summer kitchen. Four generations of Clemence and now Jean-Francois V. They've argued about this, he and Marie-José. Ils sont tous morts, vos parents, vos grands-papas. C'est votre tour. Jean-Francois will hear none of it. The Laurentians, you might say, suit him to a T. To put it precisely like the mountains, he is not a man who embraces change. For Jean-Francois, je me souviens, the words on the license plate of his Ford station wagon, the exact same car his father favored, aren't a political statement. For Jean-Francois, je me souviens is a way of life. Every Friday at 5.30 precisely, he and Marie-José drive north, and every August, like his father and grandfather before him, they spend the entire month at the cottage. After all, is there anything more pleasant or more reassuring than an afternoon at Petit Lac Noir? Marie-José on the chaise longue reading Marie-Claire and sipping homemade limonade. Jean-Francois trimming the front lawn, the lawn his great-grandfather planted and cared for, keeping it up is Jean-Francois's pride and joy. That's how they spent the last Saturday of this August, most of it anyway. 
Jean-Francois puttering with the grass, Marie-José reading magazines, though after lunch, Marie-José did set Jean-Francois to work in the garden, a huge bed of wildflowers that stretches right across the front of the cottage. I want it looking its very best, she said. Hey, remember who's coming. They were expecting guests, a younger couple who they befriended years ago and they hadn't seen in, could it be that long, donc, a decade. At five o'clock precisely, Jean-Francois came in, took off his gardening gloves and said, Eh bien. Marie glanced at the clock over the kitchen door. It was time for his Saturday swim. Jean-Francois has a dip every Saturday at five, until the Saturday after Labor Day when he folds his trunks and puts them away until Saint Jean-Baptiste. <laughs> she smiled at him and reached out and touched his face. The scars on his cheek were raised and a little inflamed. It was hot. He'd been working hard. The scars were one of the great lessons in Jean-Francois's life. He got them in an altercation with a deranged cockatoo. <laughs> For the first 10 years of his practice, he didn't treat birds at his clinic. But after a protracted campaign waged by his receptionist, an impatient and flighty girl, he relented and agreed to treat the cockatoo, the first and the last bird he ever admitted. <laughs> he had stayed late, as was his habit, on a Tuesday night, Tuesday night being the night he does the books. So he was, as fate would have it, without backup when he went down to the basement to check the assorted dogs, cats, rodents, and solitary bird, which appeared to be going bald losing feathers to some unknown malaise. He was holding the cockatoo up to his face and whispering to it in that ridiculous baby style that birds seem to encourage, thinking while he did it that he might have been too inflexible about birds, that perhaps his receptionist had been right all along, that he should reconsider. He wondered what he might possibly say to her when the cockatoo abruptly turned and said something to him that sounded disturbingly adult. <laughs> Something you would never hear in church. <laughs> and then the bird sank his beak into Jean-Francois's cheek and wouldn't let go, or maybe couldn't let go. Both Jean-Francois and the cockatoo panicked when they realized what had happened, and the two of them began flapping wildly. The <laughs> The bird shredding Jean-Francois's cheek with his claws until Jean-Francois realized panic wasn't going to get him anywhere. And he stumbled into the OR, grabbed a needle that he had prepared for the next day's surgery, and plunged it into the bird's back, anesthetizing it. Then he drove himself to emergency at Hotel Dieu with the drug cockatoo dangling from his face. like an earring. <laughs> this was over 30 years ago. The intern who removed the bird still tells the story at dinner parties. <laughs> I thought the guy was crazy, he had begun. He was barely coherent. He was screaming, it's going to wake up, it's going to wake up. <laughs> I said, that parrot isn't going to wake up, that parrot is dead. <laughs> He said, no, no, it's just resting. <laughs> Jean-Francois's wound got infected and healed poorly. And he learned his lesson. It wasn't a new one. More a confirmation than a lesson, really. But there you have it, plain as day. Change never led to any good. <laughs> From then on, he stuck to dogs and cats. He went to the cottage on the weekends and to Old Orchard Beach in Maine every July. <laughs> the scars slowly faded with the years, and these days only announce themselves when Jean-Francois is tired or upset, and he does his best to avoid both. <laughs> Dave met Jean-Francois the summer after he and Morley were married. They met when Dave and Morley rented a cottage just down the road from the Clemence. That was the summer Dave and Morley had already spent what little vacation money they had on a trip to Holland. 
They had flown there for a weekend in February so Morley could fulfill one of her lifetime dreams and skate along the frozen canals. Dave heard about it, the cottage down the road from the Clement place, from an old friend in Montreal. You'd love it there, he said. No one will bother you, and it would be cheap. This was, as I said, a summer when cheap was important. His friend called back a week later. You can have it for free, he said. All you have to do is a few chores. Cool, said Dave. <laughs> they left at the beginning of August in Morley's old orange and white Volkswagen van. The trip took almost 10 hours. They went along old highway number seven, stopping every couple of hours for coffee or a cheese factory outside Smith Falls, for cheese burgers at a little stand in the middle of nowhere. They shared the driving the way they shared just about everything in those days. They crossed the Ottawa River at Hawkesbury, and from there they rattled north onto Highway 329 and into the gray-blue Laurentians. Morley was squinting at a little piece of paper. Okay, she said, reaching out and turning the music down. It says to make the following turns. Gauche, gauche, droite. Dave said, huh? <laughs> Morley said, that means left, left, right. Right? Right, said Dave. Right, said Morley, but not right away. Gauche, gauche, then right. Right, said Dave. But first left, left, said Morley. Then right, right, said Dave. Right, said Morley. This went on for several more minutes than it should have. And they were feeling pretty goofy as they passed the gas station and the general stores and the white church and eventually pulled onto a dirt road with a bunch of cottages. Dave slapped the steering wheel and cranked the music back up. This is going to be great, he said. They passed a few cottages and then they saw the lake for the first time and a small, neat cottage with pale blue trim. Well, that was easy, said Dave as he pulled into the driveway. Easy until they lifted the welcome mat and there was no key where the key was supposed to be. Morley stood there for a moment looking around and then she slid her hand under a planter on the step beside the mat and she smiled. There was the key. The house was in much better shape than Dave had been told. <laughs> Old to be sure, but not run down like his friends had warned. It was clean and neat and just about perfect. There's a wood stove, said Dave. <laughs> this is perfect. Dave's friend had sent them a note explaining what they were expected to do in exchange for their free rent. Take down a little wall between the kitchen and the living room. <laughs> and dig up the grass so they could put in a garden. <laughs> you think this is the wall they want down, said Morley. She was pointing at the door between the kitchen and the dining room. Dave shrugged. They had a week. Time enough for work tomorrow. I'll get the bag, said Dave. They found a bedroom and changed into their bathing suits. They headed across the lawn to the lake. Morley said, that's where they want the garden, I guess. Et voila, said Dave. <laughs> they stood at the end of the dock, gazing out at the lake. And then Morley touched him on the back, and she dove without testing the water. She dove clean and straight and flat. And when she came out, her long hair was floating behind her. It was the first time Dave had seen her in water, the first time they had swum together. She turned and flicked her hair and looked back. It's beautiful, she said. Dave stuck his foot in the lake and yanked it out. <laughs> it's freezing, he said. After supper, they went for a walk further along the road. That's the one that should be renovated, said Dave. <laughs> Pointing at a little bungalow with a sagging, moss-covered roof. I'm glad we're not there, said Morley. <laughs> on Tuesday morning, Morley made pancakes. They ate them on the porch. And after they had cleaned up, she said, we should get to it. Taking down a wood wall in an unfinished cottage shouldn't be too complicated. Certainly no more complicated than installing an electrical outlet in a kitchen wall. 
Dave began slowly and carefully, standing on a chair, gently prying the tongue and groove wall boards free. By late afternoon, covered in sweat, his patience spent, he was stripped to the waist, ripping down the wall with a crowbar he'd found in the woodshed. <laughs> While Dave attacked the wall, Morley was working on the garden. How big do you think they want it, she said. Morley, remember, was barely more than a girl, still in her 20s. She'd never done any gardening in her life in those days. She considered the lawn for a while, and then she marked out a rectangular bed that ran along the front of the house. She wasn't surprised they wanted the grass out. It was so incongruous. The cottage had a woodsy feel to it. The lawn was as manicured as a putting green, flat, spongy, and soft. She used an axe to hack out large hunks of grass. <laughs> then she pried the sod loose and stacked it at the end of the driveway. Morley was finished in a couple of hours. She put the axe down and she went inside and made lunch. They ate on the dock again. When they'd cleaned up, Morley stared at her garden and decided it wasn't big enough. She got the axe and ripped up another section of lawn. By supper, she had pulled up about a third of the grass. What do you think, she said. Dave thought that she'd made the garden way too big. He didn't say that, of course. Good, he said. It looks great. Things were not looking great inside. Halfway through the afternoon, Dave had uncovered a brick chimney. He'd found a sledgehammer in the shed. He'd been going at the chimney for over two hours. Dave was spent. This wasn't the way it was described to me, muttered Dave at 8 a.m. on Friday morning. They had been up since 7. For the second day running, Morley had set an alarm. They were leaving the house the next day. It was only 8, and Dave was already sweating and covered in the brick dust that hung in the air of the cottage like smoke. But he was closing in on her. With any luck, the chimney would be down by noon. This was the day they met Jean-Francois and Marie-José. <laughs> As Dave and Morley hammered away at the kitchen in their rented cottage, Jean-Francois and Marie were driving up from the city to their place. As they crested the big hill and began their descent into Notre-Dame-des-Plaines, Marie-José was staring out the car window feeling a little desperate. They were going to spend the rest of the month at the lake. The exact same month that she had lived through every year. She knew exactly how it was going to go. <laughs> On Monday morning, Jean-Francois would mow the lawn. The dandelions are terrible this year, he'd say. On Tuesdays, they would drive into St. Sauveur for groceries. Wednesday was laundry. Thursday, they would barbecue. On Fridays, a bike ride up the old Loken Trail. At 2.30 each afternoon, they would swim. At 9 o'clock, their final glass of wine. At 11 o'clock, lights out. It was like summer camp. <laughs> Except there wouldn't be one solitary surprise. Not one unexpected moment. <laughs> I should get him a whistle, she thought. <laughs> Pardon, said Jean-Francois. And then he turned the station wagon right into their driveway, and Marie-José blinked. It was Friday, August 5th, 1979, and something was different. She looked over at her husband. Jean-Francois had gone completely slack-jawed. His mouth was hanging wide open. There was an orange and white Volkswagen van parked in their normal spot. There was a pile of rubble beside the van. <laughs> and as they sat there, a guy stood up from Marie-José's chaise longue and was walking towards them. The guy was grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> Jean-Francois opened his car door and got out and stood there in an uncomprehending haze. And that was when he noticed their entire front lawn had been dug up. Well, okay, a third of the front lawn. 
He reached absentmindedly for his face and fingered his cheek. His scar was starting to throb. <laughs> he was pointing at the disaster in front of him. The guy smiled and bobbed his head encouragingly and spoke the words he had been practicing all week. Bonjour, he said. Je m'appelle Dave. <laughs> Jean-Francois didn't actually faint. <laughs> he did, however, sink to his knees, staring in disbelief at the pile of rubble and the ruined lawn. The lawn he had been weeding and spraying and mowing since he was tall enough to grasp the handle of a lawnmower. His pride and his joy. Dave was still beaming at him as he went down. Dave thought he was joking. His kind of guy. <laughs> So Dave went down to his knees, too. <laughs> and they kneeled there in front of each other for one long, silent, uncomprehending moment. And then Dave, who was thinking how happy the guy must be, reached out and grabbed his hand and shook it. And then put his arm around his shoulders and led him into the kitchen and pointed proudly <laughs> to where the kitchen wall used to be. The kitchen wall that Jean-Francois had stared at all his boyhood years. He gasped in horror. Marie-Josée was outside. She'd got out of the car and surveyed the piles of ripped sod, the scar of dirt across her lawn, and Marie-Josée had smiled. Well, she said to no one in particular, what I think we need is wildflowers. <laughs> Then she saw Morley standing uncertainly by the dock, and she pointed at the black earth and said, I love what you've done to the place. Who are you anyway? <laughs> Morley said, we're the renters. And Marie Jose said, what renters? Which is when Jean-Francois burst out of the front door and Morley burst into tears. It was Marie Jose who settled everyone down. Once she managed that, it didn't take them long to work out what had happened. Left, left, right, right? <laughs> there had been just one too many rights. Dave and Morley were supposed to be at the little cottage down the road, the one with the moss-covered roof. They tried to clear out pretty quickly. It was Marie Jose who insisted they stay for dinner. They ate on the porch. Before they ate, Jean-Francois kept walking into the kitchen and staring mutely <laughs> at the place where the wall used to be. Nothing this unexpected had ever happened in his life. But then he was standing at the kitchen sink, washing his hands. And for the first time in his life, he could see through to the dining room and the dining room window to the lac. Eh ben, he said suddenly. <laughs> Ça fait rien. What he was trying to say was, I like it. They opened a bottle of wine. By the end of the second bottle, they were laughing and they moved right past it and beyond it. And every time they circled back to it, it seemed even funnier. <laughs> As they worked on dessert, Marie-José showed them her newest piece of blown glass, a piece that she'd picked up in Maine. It was a mobile, a clatter of little glass birds. Les petits oiseaux de Marie José, said Jean Francois, rolling his eyes. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it turned out she called him Monsieur Oiseau, <laughs> the bird man. For his 50th birthday, she'd given him an antique bird cage with a stuffed parrot. <laughs> it was hanging in their bedroom in the city. Where I have to look at it, said Jean-Francois desperately. It was clear that his feelings for the stuffed bird were complicated by love. <laughs> he hated the bird, but he loved her, and you could see that. And he loved that she had given it to him. They stayed up much too late. They drank much too much wine. And Dave and Morley ended up staying overnight. And they visited each year for a couple of summers. 
This August was the first time they saw Jean-Francois and Marie-José for almost a decade. When they saw each other, Dave and Jean-Francois both dropped to their knees. <laughs> it's a thing they do. And then they got up. Dave had to help Jean-Francois, who uses a cane these days. And they walked down to the dock together, past the wildflowers that Marie-José put in. There is no lawn left anymore. It's all wild and grassy now. So Dave and Jean-Francois walked along a path that goes through the tall, wavy grass. Dave trailed his hands along the lacy seed pods and said it looked very nice. I like it better, he said, than it used to be, than the lawn. And then he tried in French. He said, c'est plus sauvage. Oui, said Jean-Francois, plus wild. <laughs> then he put his arm around Dave. Comme les montagnes, he said. Oui, said Dave. Wild come the mountains. Thank you very much.